the years before the Second World War, great progress was made within nuclear physics, and the making of an atomic bomb was made possible. The war began, and a couple of years into it, a great arms race between the participating countries began. To make an atomic bomb, an essential ingredient was heavy water, and the largest factory capable of producing great amounts of it was in Norway. When Nazi Germany invaded Norway and thus gained full control over the factory, the situation immediately became much more dangerous for the Allies. Something had to be done in order to slow down or possibly stop the production of a German atomic bomb. Hello, guten Tag. Um, so in the past few years a lot has happened within uh, nuclear physics and we have learned that if you take an atom and you uh, split it, a large amount of energy. Speak is charged, you should say. That's because of what he is doing. And uh, what are you going to use this technology for exactly? <laughs> We actually intend to use this uh, technology in order to construct uh, atomic bombs or nuclear weapons. Um, just a small bomb could uh, wipe out a whole big city like London or Paris. Um, actually, if my calculations are correct, uh, just about one ton equals to about uh, 20,000 ton, tons of TNT, quite much actually. Good, I like explosions! Boom! I'm thankful for you coming to see my presentation. It uh, was fun having you here, I hope you have learned something. And uh, I will go now, please don't stay too long. So, um, have fun. Tschüss! In 1939, the Uranium Club was started, funded by Nazi Germany. They soon figured out that heavy water was an essential ingredient to making an atomic bomb. And where would they get that from? Norway, of course. Here at Ryukan in Telemark, the Wehrmark factory could be found. The facility was owned by Norsk Hydro and was originally used to mass produce chemical fertilizers. Your turn. Uh, my turn, okay. Um, shall we see? Yeah, klar. <laughs> you did not see that coming. You can invade large countries in Europe with ease, but yet you cannot beat me in a game of chess. Uh, shut up before I send you to Auschwitz as a prisoner! Yeah? Office? Yeah? Uh, one time I was on the Can you give me the phone? No. Yeah. And he has found out how to make uh, an atomic bomb. It comes to bring a gross city with only a ton of. Really? Fantastic. I will inform of you immediately. Hmm? Wait, wait, wait. You, you must. Uh... Ask the Führer of uh, permission to uh, invade Norwegen. But why? We drink Telemark. Which uh, can only be obtained at uh, the Wehrmark factory in Telemark. Okay. Ich will, ich will erst. Danke. Der General wants to invade Norway in mein Führer. Why? There are resources there that will enable us to create something called an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. To be able to blow up la large cities like London to pieces with just a ton of bombs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. I am getting old. As a byproduct, the facility also produced certain amounts of heavy water. 
In 1939, this was Europe's largest consistent source of the chemical, and was therefore a target for the Nazi Germans, but also for the French and other allies during the war. When Germany, along with France, offered large amounts of money for this byproduct, the facility at Vimorg was changed in order to produce more of the transparent gold. Germany now had competitors also trying to get their hands on the heavy water. This competition increased the price and made it hard to get enough for the production of an atomic bomb. And as the Nazis believed they were going to invade and gain control over the whole world eventually anyway, why not invade Norway at once? And so, on April the 9th, 1940, they did. There is air and sea vehicles, along with around 120,000 German soldiers knocked on Norway's door in the middle of the night between the 8th and 9th. April. The Germans placed their armed forces all along the Norwegian coast, especially outside the larger cities like Oslo, Stavanger and Trondheim, and demanded their surrender. Norway refused and went to war against Germany, only to lose about a year later. So now, Norsk Hydro was forced to sell the heavy water to Nazi Germany, which they gladly did, giving the Germans a significant advantage over the Allies when it came to the making of the atomic bomb. They had taken a step further against world domination. Loyal Norwegians working at the Vemork power plant quickly reported to Great Britain about the situation and together they started to plan an attack on the power plant. The original plan consisted of two main parts Operation Gruz and Operation Freshman. Operation Gruz consisted of dropping Norwegian locals and commandos into the area around the factory, acting as an advance force. Operation Freshman would then be initiated, with two gliders towed by bomber planes loaded up with British military engineers would land at a frozen lake, where the Grouse team would be awaiting them. The combined teams would then enter the facility and disable the production of heavy water by blowing up the factory. The first of the two operations was performed without any problems whatsoever. Operation Freshman, however, did not go so well. All air vehicles but one crashed into Norwegian mountains as a result of very bad weather. The survivors of the crashes were all executed by Germans shortly after. All in all, 41 Englishmen died as a result of this failed mission. The Norwegian Grouse team now had to spend even more time out in the cold nature living off mainly reindeer and other supplies they had brought with them. As Operation Freshman had failed, the British in command had to go back to the drawing board and create a new plan. The new Operation Gunnerside was planned, and six Norwegian parachute soldiers were dropped near the Grouse Group in February the following year. Two teams found each other and approached the heavy water factory carefully. As a consequence of the failed Operation Freshman, the Germans were now aware that the British were interested in the factory and had therefore strengthened the security around and in the facility. This made the task considerably harder, but not impossible. The Grouse team had waited about three months for the additional soldiers, and the Germans had therefore let their guards slightly down. In order to avoid the mines that had been laid down as additional security, the group had to cross a ravine to be able to enter the facility. As the only bridge was heavily guarded, they had to cross the ravine otherwisely. On the other side, the group followed a railway which was not protected with mines, without encountering any guards. The group now split up in two parts, one to keep watch while the other infiltrated the factory and placed the explosives in order to disable the factory. In the main chamber, a Norwegian who worked at the factory was encountered, but he was loyal to his country and willingly helped the crew blow up the facility.
هلا اجى الزعيم العظيم هذا الفيت لما لا Groups now joined each other again and retreated back into the wilderness where they found the two radio operators who had been left there to report to London. Without having to fire a single shot, the crew managed to blow the production chamber to pieces, effectively destroying 900 kilograms of heavy water, along with instruments needed to produce more of her. The group now split again and retreated further away from the facility, followed by the German guards. Both groups managed to escape from the area. One of them stayed in the area to further sabotage the transport of the remaining heavy water, while the others skied towards Sweden from where they would travel to London. One eternity later. Although the sabotage had been successful, the damage that was made to the factory was nothing the Germans couldn't fix, and a couple of months later, the facility was back up and running again. When rebels found out about this, they immediately reported to England, and a series of bombings were performed. The bombings did disable the factory temporarily, but it didn't take long before it was back up again. A year later, in 1944, yet another sabotage operation was conducted. This time, the target was not the factory itself, but the ferry carrying the heavy water across Lake Tinsjö. The Norwegian saboteur, Knut Haukeli, planted a timed bomb on board the boat and successfully sank it in the middle of the lake. Fourteen Norwegians and four Germans were killed during the operation. The sabotage capped the objective of the very first mission and halted the German atomic bomb development program. The Uranium Club never managed to weaponize the science before the surrender in May 1945.